Hello, everyone, and welcome to GTC 2021. My name is Prithvi Kashankuti. I'm a deep learning systems engineer at NVIDIA. And today, uh, we're excited to present our talk, Accelerating AI at Scale with Celine DGX A100 Superpod and Parallel File System Storage. So hello, everyone. Welcome to GTC. And so I'm William Baudin from DDN. And so my team and I have been working very closely with Predvi and the rest of the NVIDIA team for the last 18 months to design the A3i data platforms that we are integrating as part of the Celine Superpod. And so um, we're very happy, extremely happy to be part of the success with Celine and also um, to talk to you today and be able to show you the details of the technology that's behind this project. So our talk today uh, will be broken up into three main sections. So we'll start first with uh, a set of introductions, first talking about uh, the challenges of AI at scale, and then briefly touching on DGX A100 and Celine. Uh, this is intended to give our audience a brief overview of some of the topics that we'll be deep diving later in the talk. And uh, next, we'll, we'll go into a deep dive of the Celine storage architecture, trying to answer the question of what it's made of and how it all connects together. And then finally, we'll discuss both synthetic and real application performance uh, running on the Selene Superpod and try and illustrate to you how well does the ar architecture actually perform in practice. If you're here at GTC, then odds are you already know how important AI is and will continue to be for your industry. At the core of AI are the model architectures. These define how input data is transformed into results and predictions. This style of machine learning was repopularized around 2012 with the introduction of the AlexNet model for the image classification benchmark ImageNet. And since then has gone on this uh, upward trend of increasingly demanding models in terms of compute capability. So this chart shows the trend of the petaflops per day uh, training requirements for various models across time. Um, this chart, while it uh, stops at about 20, uh, 2020 uh, with GPT-2 at the top right representing some of the most demanding models in terms of petaflops per day um, has already been surpassed by new architectures that are continually evolving and uh, being published. Data is what drives the insights created by these models. The more data you have and the more quality data you have can create better models. And as a result, the data sets themselves have been trying to grow to keep up with this demand. Um, Many of you in the audience are probably familiar with some of the data sets that I've described on this slide. Um, public data sets such as the English Wikipedia and uh, common crawl data sets um, are commonly used for natural language processing applications. Um, ImageNet, of course, is, is uh, a quintessential public data set for image recognition and, and pre-training of models for other image-based tasks. Um, these data sets um, while they are, are um, sizable, um, can still fit on a, a regular laptop. Um, however, there are other applications within AI that have even larger requirements in terms of their data. For example, reinforcement learning, where you might have uh, self-play agents generating uh, continual amounts of data for different scenarios or autonomous vehicles, which are driving around for data collection, gathering images from various sensors and um, feeding that back into training cycles. Um, so uh, as, as these applications continue to evolve, the data sets continue to evolve with them. Yep, and to build on Predvi's comments, I mean, from the DDN view, right, this really reflects kind of the broader trends that we see with customers who are pursuing AI at scale, especially with superpods, right? So AI workloads and data sets are increasingly demanding on performance, capacity, and capabilities from uh, storage and network. And so, you know, on one hand, the data platforms have to satisfy um, extremely data-intensive workloads and workflows, and we'll discuss some example applications later in the session. 
And on the other hand, you know, we're seeing increasingly larger data sets being assembled for different use cases. So it's not uncommon for um, some of our customers, some of the programs we, uh, we see in AI to have data sets and volumes in the tens and hundreds of petabytes with billions of unique objects in them. And so that means that data platforms uh, have to hold on to increasingly larger volumes of data and more um, diverse types of data, small files, big files, metadata, and still deliver good performance across the board. Um, and so really with that in mind, I think to the point of the session, it's important to choose the right technology, the right architecture for the network and the storage um, that are around the super pod. Now let's, let's spend a bit of time uh, on a brief intro of uh, the server, DGX A100, and the systems, uh, Selene. The DGX A100 is a complex machine. It has two AMD Rome CPUs, eight A100 Tensor Core GPUs, and six NV switches, all housed in a 6U chassis capable of providing five petaflops of AI training performance. Uh, as you'll notice on the diagram at the bottom here, there's a lot of IO capability built into this, this server. In fact, 10 total NVIDIA Mellanox uh, CX6 network interface cards power the data transfer for both compute and storage. Now, scaling up from the single server, let's take a moment to talk about how we combine these, these individual units into a larger compute infrastructure uh, and eventually scaling up to the DGX A100 superpod. So one of the things I wanna emphasize here is the uh, modularity and scalability of, of this design. Starting from individual DGX A100 servers, uh, they can be clustered together uh, at various scales to create solutions that meet the specific compute requirements for various use cases. Uh, these single systems are, are combined into what we call scalable units, uh, which are groups of 20 nodes. And uh, using seven of these scalable units, we can create a 1K uh, GPU pod consisting of 140 nodes, DGX A100 uh, servers, all interconnected with Mellanox, HDR, and Cineband, all running at 200 uh, gigabits, per, gigabits per second. Uh, to support the IO needs of these heavy machines, uh, the pod is specced with a very fast first tier of storage. And here in this design, we use 10 of the DDN AI400X appliances with the Exascaler software stack uh, to produce a parallel file system that serves the production needs of this cluster. For those of you carefully studying the diagram on the right, you might notice that we actually have two separate, uh, two separate fabrics, one dedicated for compute and one dedicated for storage. In all cases, it might not be possible or really needed for your use case to have these two separate fabrics. But when we were designing Selene, the DGX A100 SuperPod, we set out knowing the applications that we plan to run on this cluster and their compute needs. And specifically, we set up with a goal knowing that we need to be able to support one terabyte per second of bandwidth from our first tier storage to be able to meet the IO needs of the systems in the cluster. Separating the compute and storage fabric allowed us to, uh, uh, dis uh, to, to separate these two data pads and give us the ability to meet that design goal. And uh, we'll touch on the specifics of the uh, topology in, in a subsequent slide. Taking the pod design one step further, the super pod design allows us to combine individual 1K GP pods into a single infrastructure. The diagram on the right shows how you can take four of these 1K GP pods and interconnect them together into a single 4K GP machine. And this is the architecture that we've used for Selene. Four 1K GP pods uh, for a total of 560 DGX A100 systems. Uh, in the previous slide, I mentioned the modularity and, and expandability of this design. And, and, it, and it's very key to one of the unique aspects of, of this design. Uh, the architecture was created in a way that you could combine these 1K GP pods together without any need for recabling the fabric. Uh, and this is made possible by having core switches distributed across the various pods. 
And when you're, when you're expanding the cluster, you simply interconnect these uh, core switches together to join into a single compute unit. And, and this is a really big deal. Uh, if you've ever gone through the exercise of trying to recable an ID fabric, you, you know exactly what I'm talking about. And, and even if you haven't, um, imagine the pain and, and the uh, effort required to try and recable tens of kilometers of InfiniBand cables together um, while maintaining production uh, for your users. And, and you'll, you'll understand a bit of why being able to expand in place is, is a pretty big deal. And so this growth aware design allows you to scale from a single row of systems as shown in the bottom left here to a full data center um, of multiple pods combined in together for a DGX superpod. Uh, and this, this picture on the left here is actually a rendering of what the actual Selene data center looks like. Yeah, and I think we we had some really we had to juggle some really interesting parameters. I think uh, with the Celine project. So on one hand, you know, we had to build um, a uniquely powerful data platform, right, that satisfied the requirements of the Celine uh, system, which is a supercomputer. Uh, and at the same time, we also had to deliver, you know, full performance from the box to production in record time, right? Similar buildouts can usually span months or a year, and we had to shrink the timeline to weeks. And on the other hand, you know, the ask from Nvidia was also to come up with a modular design that matched the super part architectures that you could scale the data platform as evenly and as nicely as um, Predvi described it. And so from our perspective, you know, the obvious ask was for us to deliver um, a data platform that guaranteed reliable performance for a broad range of AI workloads running on a very large number of very powerful compute clients. And so we had different types of applications, different scales, different data types. And so, we proposed a shared parallel file system solution with all NVMe devices. Um, so it would give us the most ability, the most flexibility uh, to satisfy this broad mix of workloads and use cases. Um, we also had to design uh, with an open architecture in mind. So we wanted to have the ability to take the same technology and bring uh, the data platform that we designed for Celine to other SuperPod customers at kind of different scales. And so the objective was to kind of lay the foundations for a reference template together um, that other customers, other joint customers could rely on to achieve, you know, that really great performance uh, for a wide range of workloads. Um, and also ultimately was really about giving them a simple rapid path to deploy the data platform along with their super board. So get predictable capacity, capability, performance. Um, and obviously we had to take high availability and reliability uh, as a priority consideration within the design. I mean, you consider the scale of a sy system like Selene, right? Um, we have to implement multiple features, right, to minimize unplanned downtime, which really can get expensive if you're dealing with a multi-megawatt sized operation. Um, we also have to build in kind of data management capabilities to help structure uh, the users and the environments. I'm sure Predvi has got a lot of really good stories of running the place for 18 months. Um, but ultimately, right, that structure is mandatory. If you're handing large amounts of volumes of data, you're dealing with a large population of users, you need to be able to coordinate everything. And so we put in the features to do that. And along the way, it was really important for us to put instrumentation, plenty of instrumentation across the stack so that we make sure that we could understand, we can understand how the applications, how the users interact with data, analyze the system and make optimizations, also troubleshoot issues rapidly. And looking back, I think we achieved our core objectives very successfully. Um, and ultimately, I think, you know, the, the best part of the whole project was um, the strong relationship that we grew between our teams, being able to move rapidly together, learn together, uh, develop together, uh, and get up and running very quickly. I don't know, Predvi, how do you feel about working together for 18 months? Was it fun? Certainly, yeah, uh, very fun. Um, a, lot of, a lot of learning experiences. And, and I think um, what, what stands out to me is one of the more interesting points is that this, is, this was a real thing that we set out to do. You know, we had the design in mind. We knew how we wanted to grow from, uh, uh, from a smaller unit up into the full size of Selene. And we wanted to be able to take on that effort of, of going through the pain of putting this together and figuring out where the gaps were um, so that customers, uh, uh, joint customers of ours can go out and take the same architecture for whatever scale that they need and have the confidence of knowing that somebody has done this and that it works um, and, and what the performance expectations can look like. And, um, 
Uh, another part of it is, uh, you know, certainly there is the engineering collaboration, which there's been a great deal of. Uh, but uh, on my perspective, as an administrator, uh, I'm a customer uh, to DDN. And so as a customer, I get that added peace of mind uh, in production. I know that when uh, I have a problem on my file system on a Saturday morning, that I'm not alone. I have a friend at William that I can pick up the phone and call and, and get that support um, there and, and know that I can still keep my afternoon home. Um, so, so being able to, to grow throughout this time has been a, has been a really unique uh, opportunity between, between both of us. So now that we're all familiar with the uh, high level of the Selene architecture, let's uh, drill down into the specific details. Let's see what it's made of and how is everything in this design connected together. So I touched on this point earlier, uh, the idea of scalable units being the building block that is used to expand this design to the scale that meets, uh, meets your needs. Um, based on the number of scalable units that you have, uh, we can determine what the fabric looks like to support storage and compute nodes uh, for the various scales. So the diagram on the, on the bottom here shows a, a depiction of the two level topology, uh, leaf and spine level, needed to connect, in this case, 100 nodes together you know, along with storage. So you'll notice that uh, using the diagram in the top right, that these various scales have uh, a subscription ratio associated with them. So the topology is not full fat, uh, but we know that uh, based on our design goals that we don't really need a full fat design for the storage architecture. We're able to meet our performance requirements um, with a slightly smaller bill of materials. And um, Another thing that I'd like to point out on this slide is that you can actually go up to 140 nodes, um, seven scalable units, with just two layers of IB topology, the leaf and spine level. Beyond that, which we use in the Selene architecture, you need to introduce a third level. Based on the size of the Selene DGX Superpod, we know that we needed to use three levels of a three-level topology to create um, uh, the full superpod design. So the diagram that I'm showing here is a depiction of the storage fabric for one K GPU pod. Again, this is 140 nodes per pod, two HDR200 connections per node. As I mentioned in the previous slide, uh, the topology here is not full fat. We use uh, a three to two ratio and we have connections from the spine level and the core level from each of these 1K GPU pods going to the other three in the case of Selene. We have a total of 128 HDR 200 connections which connect each 1K GPU pod to another for a total of um, 3,200 uh, 3, gigabytes per second, which is well over the uh, one, uh, one terabyte design point that we referred to earlier. Another very unique part of this design is, is its resiliency to switch failures. So inevitably in production, we, will, we could expect to encounter some kind of issue on the fabric. And um, rather than have that take down the entire production, um, we have procedures in place that are able to replace IV switches in production while minimally impacting the performance of jobs running on the cluster. And in particular, uh, the maximum performance impact that we would see um, is a 7% uh, performance hit to the peak bandwidth level when we're down one switch on the core and spine level. So um, this design allows us to have um, large amounts of, of bandwidth that we can use to provide storage capability to the rest of uh, the superpod. So as you guys have seen, InfiniBand is a critical part of the Selene architecture. It is what we use for uh, data, uh, data traffic uh, for the compute side, as well as for um, data to our storage systems. Um, it integrates seamlessly with uh, the DGX A100 systems and, and the DDN AI400X appliances. And um, it also provides um, a mature technology 
um, over and provide some benefits over more traditional networking approaches. Um, higher bandwidth, low latency, less CPU overhead, um, thinking about DMA. Um, and one of the uh, unique parts about this with respect to storage is that the network type is, is transparent to the users. Um, the Exascaler software handles the integration of the IDE libraries into the file system so that from my perspective as an admin, it's just a file system that I'm mounting on my node and, and users can access from there. Um, and yeah. um, no need to worry about uh, configuring traffic and, and routing as well. I think, you know, one of the things that we've noticed and we, we, that was really obvious to me as we were going through this project is how as a technology platform, uh, InfiniBand networking has really become more accessible, right? It's evolved to a point where it could be very simple to deploy and manage, right? Even at scales with systems like Selene, right? You can count on some of the uh, plug and play modularity out of the box with a simplified experience, right? At the same time, you know, there's a very solid set of tools that help you kind of deploy, optimize, and manage the InfiniBand network with kind of that same simplicity as what you'd expect from other mainstream network technologies like Ethernet. All right. So now let's, let's look a little bit closer at what this storage architecture actually looks like in the data center. So the picture that I have here on the right is a real picture of uh, two of the storage racks uh, throughout uh, Celine. Uh, two racks are used per GPU pod, 1K GPU pod, uh, meaning that Celine has uh, four of these two rack configurations throughout. And at the top, you see the uh, 40 total HDR200 IB switches that I, I uh, showed in the previous slide, topology. And uh, in red at the bottom here are the AI400X appliances, uh, the 10 systems per 1KGP pod. So these are all uh, NVMe systems, uh, 2.4 petabytes of usable capacity, very high data rates that they can, they can sustain, uh, 500, gigabytes per second read and 355, uh, 350 gigabytes per second write performance. Um, it uses a total of 80 HDR100 interfaces into the storage fabric. Um, and for the entire Celine design, um, we scale this building block up four times, meaning that we have 40 total uh, AI400X appliances, um, 10 petabytes of usable capacity, and the peak performance that we expect from these systems scales linearly with the number of systems. So we expect uh, two terabytes per second read and 1.4 terabytes per second of write performance uh, across the entire view of the storage. Yep, and I think as Predvi mentioned, so the DDN AI 400X appliance is kind of that core building block that uh, we are using for the shared parallel storage system on Selene. And so it's an integrated appliance that we've optimized to kind of deliver uh, a predictable performance for a wide range of load, uh, workloads and also data types. And so, you know, a single AI 400X delivers about 50 gigabytes a second of read throughput, about 35 gigabytes a second of write throughput and 3 million IOPS on random reads. And so um, it's all in VME, it provides a fixed set of capacity. And so um, what we decided to do was design a modular building block that arrives kind of pre-configured. And if you need to go beyond what a single appliance uh, can provide, right, we get that nice linear scaling of performance and capacity when you add multiple uh, units. And so like Predvi was saying, when we go from uh, with 10 units, we're able to simply hit that 500 gigabytes a second read, 350 gigabytes a second write very, uh, very easily. And so really what's important there is that linear scaling allows us to be predictable in how our design is going to function. And so we're able to uh, build solutions, right, different pods, integrate pods together and uh, predict how the uh, storage infrastructure is going to perform uh, reliably and also with very high confidence. And we tested it, right? I think we went to what, 40, 40 AI400X and almost 560 uh, DGXA100 clients interacting simultaneously with the shared storage platform without any issue. And um, really the key to it is the DDN Exascaler software that's embedded within the AI400X appliance. And so uh, it's a shared uh, parallel file system. It's the same uh, software that we use to power the majority of the world's largest supercomputer. It's based on the Lustre file system, which is an open source platform. And so we uh, host the project and we actually augment uh, the file system to make it exascalar. We have um, features, uh, additional patches for performance, for reliability, for data management. And so that way, when you take the appliance, 
um, there's no ambiguity. You get a prefix block um, that gives you a certain amount of performance, uh, uh, performance capacity capability, uh, and you've got you know backing by DDN support and then and uh, deployment services. And so you basically get full-on supercomputing storage performance in an enterprise-grade robust platform, similar to kind of what DGX brings to compute. And so for the data platform on the Selene system, right, we went for a shared parallel architecture. And really, that's the key to being able to run all these HPC and AI workloads on the DGX superpod uh, flexibly. And so we needed to satisfy data transaction with a large number of very powerful climate, uh, clients simultaneously. So each DGX is kind of like a mini supercomputer. And really, um, parallelism is the key to achieving uh, the performance level required for satisfying an individual nodes and also the entire cluster um, at any given time. And so if you look at the top left of the slide, we kind of illustrate how the shared parallel architecture works, right? Every client connects uh, and interacts with every storage server in parallel simultaneously. And within each one of the connections between a client and a server, we have multiple parallel data paths. And so that gives us the ability to deliver data with a high throughput, uh, and high concurrency. And that's how we're able to achieve kind of these very high um, data delivery capabilities on a single DGX, right? We've done what, about 50 gigabytes a second, roughly, of throughput. Um, and so what's good is basically that way, whatever workload you're running, right, um, we're able to keep the GPU satisfied at all times. And uh, since it's a shared architecture, we can distribute that full performance to all the client nodes simultaneously within the super pod. And so it also means that we can store the data in a single location. So every node in the superpod can read and write um, to the shared storage at the same time. So you don't have to copy data around between different places to get performance. Um, another key aspect of this, right, is the architecture scales linearly and kind of in every dimension, every way. And so on the client side, right, it's really attached. It's very easy to attach more client nodes. And so Celine was commissioned in phases up to the 500, the full 560 client nodes. And, um, we gradually were able to add more nodes and gradually bring in the pods together and integrate very, very nicely. And so it's a very robust architecture that way. It's kind of proven at these very big scales. And on the server side, right, we can scale performance and capacity linearly by just adding more groups of AI 400X appliances. And so there's no penalty when you grow, right? It just scales linearly very predictably. Um, and one last little tidbit that's interesting about the parallel architecture, the shared architecture, is really we go through um, continuous integration, technology integration cycles. And so the way the software architecture is built, right, it makes it very simple for everyone, for us, for our users, to integrate like new network technology, new types of storage. Um, and, you know, we're really pushing to get the latest and greatest integrated in our appliances, but also make sure we squeeze out the full performance of the hardware. So having um, that ability to continuously integrate new technologies uh, has definitely helped us throughout the Selene build-out process, being able to test out you know, new versions of codes, new networks, of, and new types of network adapters, new types of firmware, and just being able to very flexibly, rapidly iterate um, is important to it. And one last thing, um, with regards to why we chose it, and you contrast all of that with the drawing on the lower left of the side, right? So the other alternative architecture that often comes up is NAS with very serial network protocols like NFS. And so those are fine for modest volumes of data and certain workloads, but they're point to point and they're serial. And what happens is that creates all sorts of limitations around performance, capacity, and scalability. And the more you scale in, in that model, the more the limitations become problematic. So it's just the nature of the NAS architecture and the serial protocols like NFS. Um, they just don't provide the levels of performance and capabilities you need with SuperPod. And so that's why we propose that shared parallel architecture designed for Selene, and um, it's been successful. So Predity's got some good data points, I think, on the next few slides to show that. Absolutely. So now that we've talked through some of the, uh, the details of the storage design on Selene, let's see how it works. Uh, and we'll start first with synthetic application performance um, to, to prove out the capabilities that we've talked about. So quickly, I'll, I'll take a brief aside uh, to talk a bit about uh, monitoring on Selene. So we've spent a tremendous amount of effort continually bolstering our capabilities uh, to monitor and understand what the cluster is doing at any given time. So metrics like temperatures, clocks, power, capacity, uh, uh, performance uh, on the, on, um, uh, from, from the individual uh, server or, or appliance level all the way through to the data center level. 
Uh, and many of the charts that, uh, that I'll be talking about uh, the performance results from are taken directly from a lot of these uh, telemetry views. Um, there is a, a bunch to talk about with Celine monitoring. I recommend you check out this talk uh, listed below here, uh, given by some of my colleagues who, who do a deep dive on the, um, the monitoring capabilities. Okay, so for our first synthetic benchmark, uh, we choose to measure uh, the performance for 10 AI400X appliances, or one pod uh, worth of, of um, appliances. And the benchmark here we use is IOR, which is intended as a synthetic benchmark to prove the um, bandwidth that we can read and write from uh, these storage appliances. And on the right, I show a plot for um, increasing powers of two number of client nodes, uh, DGX A100, reading and writing to uh, the shared file system on this uh, set of 10 AI400X appliances. And there's two key takeaways that you can get from, from this graph. Um, at the single node level, you see that we reach um, close to line rate of the two 200 gig HDR200 connections, uh, getting close to um, that uh, above 45 gigabytes per second read and write. And as you continue to scale the number of clients, you see that for 16 clients and above, we can actually reach and saturate the performance um, expectations for these 10 AI400X appliances that we referred to earlier. So actually achieving the 500 gigabytes per second read and 350 gigabytes per second write, uh, which really speaks to um, that linear scalability of these AI400X appliances as we uh, continue to grow and expand. Yep, and a quick note on here too. What's interesting is as you see, um, so we get to the peak, right, with between that 10 to 16 appliances, but as you engage more nodes, right, if I look towards the right side of the graph, as you can see, the peak performance gets distributed kind of fairly evenly across all the other nodes. And so really that's the advantage of these parallel architectures. You can hit that performance very rapidly, um, but you can also kind of spread it out fairly evenly and automatically across all your nodes. All right. And so for uh, this synthetic benchmark, we again revisit IOR, uh, but instead of looking at the uh, 10 AI400X appliance configuration, uh, we look at the Selene production configuration. Um, today in production, we're using 20 of these AI400X appliances clustered together into a single shared parallel file system. And repeating the same IOR benchmark as before, um, using 64 clients in this production configuration, we're able to achieve one terabyte per second read and 700 gigabytes per second write performance. Um, again, uh, this really demonstrates that, that scalability, doubling the amount of appliances gives you double the amount of read and write performance. And um, uh, this graph that I'm showing here on the bottom is actually taken directly from our, uh, our telemetry views, uh, where we look at the aggregate performance of the file system across uh, the different appliances to, to get a sense of how um, the bandwidth provided by these appliances reaches uh, the, the peak that we expect. Okay, so at this point, you might be thinking to yourself, yeah, that's cool, you can run IOR really fast, but you know, who cares, right, big deal. How does this really impact any, any AI application? And uh, it's a great question. And so what we'd like to do in these next few slides is talk about real applications and see how those real applications perform on Sony. Some of you in the audience may be familiar with uh, the uh, MLPerf training benchmark, which is uh, an industry effort targeted for uh, standardizing different ML benchmarks, uh, representing a variety of use cases and uh, data types. Um, this is a um, benchmark that, um, uh, that uh, submitters can provide uh, results for uh, in, in terms of time to train for various benchmarks using their own software stacks and, and hardware capabilities uh, to really demonstrate the, the capability of their solution. And um, when we at NVIDIA uh, work on MLPerf. Uh, Selene is one of the main platforms that we use for developers to develop, tune, and actually run their benchmarks and, and produce results. Um, in order to 
squeeze every little second out of the uh, benchmarks. Uh, these data sets are typically uh, put on the local storage of each of the compute nodes um, just to optimize the IO path. Uh, but this isn't really a realistic production scenario. Uh, you know, certainly, uh, not only is the admin load uh, um, surprisingly challenging to be able to manage data sets individually on these nodes, uh, but you also run into space constraints. Uh, there's only a finite amount of storage on the local nodes, which is uh, usually orders of magnitude smaller than what you might expect from a large shared file system. So uh, in order to kind of demonstrate what does the performance of these benchmarks look like when I'm trying to run from a shared file system location rather than having the, the kind of best case uh, data set locally on each node, we actually take two configurations, um, the, the BERT uh, language model workload and ResNet 50 for image-based applications and take the same benchmark that we run uh, on the, the default configuration of having the data set locally as well as having the data set on the shared uh, parallel file system and compare the results. How close can we actually get when running from a shared parallel file system as opposed to the best case? And for these two large training jobs, we see that we get very close. Um, seven, within 7% 7 and within 3% uh, respectively for BERT 128 node training and ResNet 50 96 node training. Uh, and this is a pretty monumental achievement to be able to show that at such a large scale for these very highly optimized benchmarks uh, in terms of, of uh, GPU compute that um, the shared parallel file system is really able to keep very close to uh, the best case performance that we can expect from, from these benchmarks. And um, I would refer you to the, uh, the link at the bottom here um, to look at some other configurations of benchmarks and different scales for comparing uh, the local storage and uh, the shared parallel file system. And it saves you all the headache of having to copy the data around, right? All your data is in one location. You just run from there. You don't need to worry about copying it to the local nodes and you still get pretty nearly full performance, nearly similar performance. So it's very impressive. Exactly, yes, definitely. It saves, it saves us a lot of, of time as it as as well. All right, so now let's transition to a, another commonly run workload on Selenium. So Megatron LM is a open source set of tools developed by NVIDIA's Applied Deep Learning Research Team that they use for their ongoing work for training large transformer language models. Um, Megatron LM provides the capability to train uh, large, highly capable language models like GPT-2, GPT-3, and others, and to be able to scale them from uh, 1 billion to 1 trillion parameters in size, uh, which is really starting to reach beyond the limits of the chart that we showed at the beginning um, for uh, the, the compute requirements for these types of large uh, workloads. Um, these types of workloads fall squarely into the type of category of AI applications that are made accessible by a machine like Selenium with its, um, both its storage and its compute uh, capabilities. So Megatron LM provides uh, a few unique challenges for a storage system uh, that um, separate it from what you might expect from training other models. So as I mentioned in the previous slide, these models range anywhere from a billion to a trillion parameters in size. And just the, the sheer size of these models uh, directly impacts the size of the checkpoint files. Uh, these checkpoint files being the state of the model that's saved and read um, during training. Uh, and so having larger models means that you have larger checkpoints. Um, in order to train models of this size, um, Algorithmically, there are different approaches that are taken uh, to partition the computation across nodes and across GPUs. And specifically in the case of Megatron LM, uh, this partitioning of the computation leads to multiple checkpoints being written from different ranks 
uh, across different nodes participating in the training at the same time, whenever checkpoints are read and and, and um, let's not forget that the the uh, ADLR researchers that I mentioned um, have have provided and used this library for their research um, are regular users on Feline. So that means they're subject to all of the same um, uh, job constraints. They wait in the queue when they submit their jobs. They have a limited amount of time that they're allowed to run for a specific job. Uh, and so that means that they need to be able to write and read these checkpoints at the beginning and end of, of each of their jobs. And um, that makes it even more critical to minimize the amount of time that you're spending reading and writing these checkpoint files. Every minute that hundreds of nodes on the cluster are idled waiting for I.O. is a huge um, cost for um, expensive compute cycles and also just leads to overall less productivity for our users. So to, to give some perspective on, on what these models look like, um, I'm going to use the GPT-3 uh, 13 billion parameter model as, as an example to talk about what, what this looks like in practice. So uh, as the name suggests, it has 13 billion parameters, which in the um, scope of Megatron LM is, is relatively small. Um, it uses four-way tensor parallelism and uh, two-way pipeline parallelism, which describes uh, the way that the um, model is partitioned among different ranks participating in the training. Um, this results in uh, 172 gigabytes worth of checkpoint files. Uh, split across eight files, uh, uh, depending on the, the rank of the uh, worker. And a typical training job uh, for this model might include 128 uh, compute nodes at the same time. So uh, that means that 128 compute nodes are, are reading these checkpoints and um, uh, reading the data set used to actually train them uh, every time that training is initialized. All right, so now let's look at uh, what the monitoring shows us uh, is happening during these runs of uh, GPT-3 13 billion on 128 nodes. So this slide has two graphs. On the left side, you'll see a similar graph to what we had shown previously for the synthetic benchmarks. Uh, this is an aggregate view of the file system. And we see that uh, during this initial data read of the uh, data sets and model checkpoints, that the file system reaches a peak uh, read value of 100 and, I'm sorry, 250 gigabytes per second. And on the right, we show a, um, another instrumented telemetry view looking at the InfiniBand traffic on the two storage interfaces of a particular node participating in this traffic. And so, um, at, at its peak, you see that this one individual node is pulling about four gigabytes per second um, during this uh, training initialization phase. On the other end of the storage challenges that we mentioned for Megatron LM is the checkpointing phase. So here we're looking at a uh, telemetry view of the InfiniBand fabric um, specifically for the storage interfaces of one of the nodes participating in training, where this one node is writing out about three and a half gigabytes per second of checkpoint files. And in aggregate, uh, we see seven gigabytes per second of data being written to the file system for, for this model type. So we've shown how the storage demands of a model like GPT-3, 13 billion, are fairly high. Uh, but they're still pretty far away from a lot of the synthetic benchmarks that we talked about before. Um, it's, it's important to remember that GPT-3 13 billion, while a uh, relatively large model by today's standards, um, is still much smaller than, than, the, than the size of models that we are able to scale to today, uh, even using Megatron LM. And so um, the Applied Deep Learning Research Team uh, while running on Selene, experiment with larger model variants and run these uh, model trainings at even larger scales than what I've described so far. And um, 
the view that I'm showing here from the aggregate uh, file system telemetry shows us that under normal production conditions, so just um, you know on, on, on regular days when the cluster is open for, for job, that these larger scale runs and larger model variants can actually reach that one terabyte per second of initial read um, during the, the initialization of the training cycle. And um, that's, that's a pretty big achievement in, in my estimation. Um, I know a lot of people were very excited uh, to see this graph, even though it, it looks very similar to a lot of the other ones that we've shown so far, uh, because it really shows that uh, through all the designing, uh, implementation, and, and management of the system, that we were able to carry through the design objectives we had when we set out to build Selene um, and actually realize them with, with real applications. Um, not synthetic benchmarks, um, but, but something that actually just runs on the cluster um, on, on daily basis. Um, so so this, was, this was a pretty cool, cool thing to see. This is very impressive. Very impressive. AI at scale. Absolutely. All right. So um, we talked a lot about today, uh, a lot of the work and, and the, the design uh, thinking that went into creating um, this uh, Selene cluster. Um, and while you know, we've, we've come a long way, I think there's a lot of work that continues to be done and where we, we jointly are looking at um, areas for improvement. Um, from my perspective, uh, one of the areas that, that I see as, a, as, a, as an area going forward is continuing the education um, for our user base on, on how to really take advantage of this uh, powerful storage architecture that we've designed for AI. Um, as you've seen, we have users who are, are able to really take advantage of that full capacity of the file system. Um, but, uh, uh, and you know, that really comes from being able to architect their data pipelines efficiently for the storage uh, architecture. Uh, but occasionally we still have users who, who um, are used to different ways of, of running and, um, you know, put, put millions of small files in, in one directory. Um, so so it's, an, it's kind of an, an ongoing um, admin challenge to uh, continually educate our users um, uh, for, for how to take advantage of these systems. And um, I know a lot of work uh, is going in on the DDN side as well. I think so. Another really interesting thing we've been working on is uh, this concept of DDN hot nodes. So that's an extension of the Lustre PCC project. The goal is basically being able to cache data sets uh, on local client nodes. And so the idea is by managing the space, you know, we're going to be and being able to move data from the shared storage to the local node, we'll be able to improve application performance under certain conditions. Um, by automating, having proper policy management, being able to bring data from the shared storage um, to the local node using policies, being able to flush it out automatically, that's really going to minimize the amount of data management overhead you're going to have to do. Um, and ultimately, it's really just making it simple for users. So making that whole mechanism, that whole caching mechanism, as transparent as possible. A lot of the challenges that William is describing in, in areas that they're looking at are, are areas that we see as important. Um, specifically speaking to the, the hot nodes piece, um, this could be an area for particularly metadata intensive workloads, um, which can be one area um, of workloads that we see today that could improve in the future. Um, and, and selfishly, as, as an administrator, right, uh, this sounds like a great feature. Um, I, I'd love to be able to get out of the business of, of managing user data sets and, and having people reap the benefits of this new improvement without needing to modify any, any code. So today uh, we talked a little bit about the um, Selene DGX A100 Superpod. Uh, we are the number five uh, supercomputer on the top 500 list, um, talking about how we have partnered with DDN uh, and leverage their uh, AI400X storage appliances to really enable high performance storage on this um, very powerful supercomputer. Uh, and how it's really enabling a lot of the cutting edge research that is going on today uh, actively on, on Selene. For those of you in the audience uh, who may be looking for more resources to learn more uh, after our talk, we've compiled a list of both uh, blogs and, and reference architectures, as well as talks uh, here at GCC 2021, both from the NVIDIA and DDN side. 
uh, which continue to dive into the uh, topics that, that we've discussed today and, and look at um, other, other areas of uh, technical capability. And so with that, thank you very much for uh, your attention. Hopefully you thought the session was interesting. Predvi, thank you very much for the invitation and for the phenomenal collaboration over the last 18 months. Congratulations, this is pretty awesome. It was a great project. Absolutely, it's been a, it's been a great time and, and looking forward to uh, continuing the work in, in the future.